little info about Hosea. Hosea, interesting, was a prophet of the northern kingdom to the northern kingdom, which makes him very unique. As far as you know, he's the only prophet that was actually from the northern kingdom. That comes into play here shortly. Uh, we're told that he was a son of Beri, and that's about all we know about him. His book is the first of the minor 12 prophets. So now we venture into those next 12 prophets that are called the minor prophets because their books are shorter. And according to the Jewish tradition, he is the earliest of the prophets, although Joel and Amos may argue with that. They're all pretty much the same time period. He prophesied during the reigns of Uzziah. This is right in the text, too. Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And during the days of Jeroboam, who was the king of Israel. It mentions Jeroboam. And most likely began his ministry near the end of the reign of Jeroboam, who reigned from 793 to 753 B.C. So he's 8th century, uh, mid-8th mid, mid century. And from the dates given, he was contemporary with Amos. So we do know that about Amos. Don't know much about Joel. <laughs> um, Hosea apparently prophesied because of the, the kings of the southern kingdom, we can tell, compare it to the same time period of the kings of Israel, the northern kingdom. Uh, Zechariah and Shalom, Menahem, Pekahiah, Pekah, and then Hoshea. Hoshea was the last king until the Assyrians came and took them away in 722 B.C. But it doesn't mention them in the text. It just talked about mainly Jeroboam, which is where he began. So the thing to know is under Jeroboam, it was a very prosperous time in northern kingdom, in Israel. Very prosperous. And then when these other kings came, it was very turbulent. In fact, those six kings I just named, four of them were assassinated by their successors. It was a pretty turbulent time. They were murdered by the ones who succeeded them. And so it's interesting to note, too, that the book of Hosea is, according to the scholars, is some of the most difficult Hebrew to interpret, it's Hebrew to understand. And they believe um, it's because of his dialect. Now, he didn't speak it. It's because of his written word. So, you know, we think about dialect. I always go to Matthew's gospel when Peter was in the courtyard and Christ was on trial before the Jewish leaders. And the woman came to him and said, I know you're one of them because your accent gives you away. So he had the accent of the northern kingdom. Evidently, it was in the writing, too, maybe just some of the things that he wrote. And so there wasn't much familiarity initially with northern Israelite Hebrew, but evidently that became a problem. They figured it out, um, but it made it difficult. One of the things that's interesting about Hosea is the book's genre. Uh, aside from some of the narratives in the first three chapters, the rest of it's poetic. But if you remember when we looked at Proverbs, we talked about parallelism, and we gave all the examples of different types of parallelism. They don't find that in Hosea. And so it's a different type of, <laughs> of poetry, not like traditional Hebrew poetry. And because of that, they actually have called Hosea. They're somewhere between poetry and prose, and they call it exalted prose. That's how they technically classify the book of Hosea. So let's look at then an outline. It's a pretty simple outline. Uh, the first three chapters, this is what Hosea is most known for. Chapters one through three, it's Hosea's marriage to Gomer reflects God's relationship to Israel. And we have Hosea's wife and the three children. We'll talk about that. The Lord's marriage to Israel, and then Hosea's marriage in chapter 3 is restored. He's told to go back and get her again. And chapters 4 through 11 is the indictment against Israel. Israel's broken the covenant. They have political failures, chapters 5 through 7. Religious failures, chapters 8 and 9. Israel failed to live up to its calling of the covenant. And then chapter 11, a little glimmer of sunshine there, a little light at the end of the tunnel, God's unfailing love. The prophet talks about that. And then the last three chapters, 12 to 14, is the imminent fall of Israel. Okay, So they had their sin listed, talked about, and then they're going to fall. And so chapter 12, Israel's history of rebellion. Chapter 13, Israel's punishment for being unfaithful. And then finally, the final chapter, uh, we'll go with this a little more depth later. Israel's call to repentance and restoration. So like the prophets before him, he does have that word where he's going to come out and talk about a future when there's going to be a people that are redeemed by a coming Messiah. And so as we look at that, um, how that's broken down, let's look at some of the major themes and content of Hosea. This is where we get into the meat of what's discussed here. 
And of course, the first theme would inevitably be Hosea's marriage and God's relationship to Israel. And we look at this, uh, the central theme is Israel's breaking of the covenant with God that he established them when he brought them out of Egypt, the covenant that was made at Mount Sinai. And the language the prophet uses reflects the love of God for his people alongside their idolatry. So if we look at uh, chapter 9, there's a few passages I'm going to read here because it's very interesting. In chapter 9, looking at verses 10 and then over in chapter 11. So chapter 9, verse 10, the Lord speaking through the prophet says, Like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel. Like the first fruit on the fig tree in its first season, I saw your fathers. But they came to Baal Peor and consecrated themselves to the thing of shame and became detestable like the thing they loved. So he's telling them, I loved you, but you betrayed me. That's what he's saying. And then over to verse 11, chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. And of course, you've heard that verse about out of Egypt I called my son in the New Testament talking about Christ. And another another uh, call of God to the Messiah who was in Egypt to escape Herod. We know that from Matthew's Gospel. So, Scripture is very interesting talking about that. So, the people fell into terrible sin, and they violated the covenant of God. And so, what Hosea does in chapter 4, he describes in great detail, they violated the commandments, particularly they became idol worshipers when they became prosperous. Under King Jeroboam, great prosperity during his early reign particularly, and they began to accumulate wealth. And when they got that way, we might say fat and lazy, they began to, what do we need God for? And so they turned to idols, uh, the idols of the nations around them. Look at chapter 4, verses 7 through 13. The more they increased, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people. They are greedy for their iniquity, and it shall be like people, like priests. I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. They shall eat, but not be satisfied. They shall play the whore, but not multiply, because they've forsaken the Lord to cherish whoredom, wine, and new wine, which take away the understanding. My people inquire of a piece of wood, and their walking staff gives them oracles. For a spirit of whoredom has led them astray, and they have left their God to play the whore. We hear that term over and over again. And in verse 13, they sacrifice on the tops of the mountains. They burn offerings to the hills under oak, poplar, and terebinth because their shade is good. Therefore, your daughters play the whore and your brides commit adultery. The sin of idolatry, the sin of adultery. And for these reasons, God uses that imagery of the covenant of marriage to demonstrate to the people the wickedness of these sins. Um... As I said earlier, the act which Hosea is most noted for, God instructs him in chapter 1. Listen to the language here. and It's right there in your text. Go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. Think he's trying to make a point? So, he went and took Gomer, the wife, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore a son. So how hurtful is this to God, this, this so-called whoredom? It violates the first commandment. Have no other gods before me. It violates the second commandment. Do not make for yourself a graven image. And they're worshiping idols. And God was hurt by that, angry by that, and they were going to pay the penalty for that. Right? They, had, they had forsaken him. There's one question that's been asked through the centuries, and that is this. The woman he was told to marry, Gomer, was she a harlot before he married her, or did she become unfaithful after he married her? We just don't know. But the point is, simply, he was using that as a metaphor, saying that um, she is made to represent the nation of Israel and their relationship to the Lord. They're the ones that abandoned the covenant. So then we talk about three children. He said, have children of whoredom. So the first child is a son, and he says, name him Jezreel. Now, this takes us back to the book of 2 Kings. Remember the king Jehu. And Jehu was anointed to destroy the house of Ahab because he was so wicked. 
And so in Jezreel, he carried out these bloody attacks and he killed dozens upon dozens of the family of Ahab and wiped them out. And so what God's saying through the prophet in this is that um, retribution, you know, the time of punishment has come and you will pay the price, just like in Jezreel. The second child's a daughter said, name her lo Rahama." And lo is uh, the Hebrew word for no or not. All right, so it means no more mercy for Israel. No more mercy, lo Rahama. And then the third child, a son, name him lo Ami, which means basically you're not my people any longer and I'm not your God. That's pretty, pretty graphic. You're not my people, I'm not your God. But even in the midst of that judgment and chastisement, there's words of future restoration. Look there, right below that, in, in chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. In the midst of these judgment and naming these children, these things that were going to come upon the nation, he says this, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in a place where it was said of them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. And the children of Judah... And the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. So, basically then, in a word play, in the beginning of chapter 2, he repeats the children's names, this time without the low. And he says, basically saying, there will be a time again when you will receive mercy. And there is a coming time when you will be my people again and I will be your God. And when we think about that, we can go to the New Testament. In the book of Romans, Paul uses this quote from Hosea. And he says in chapter 9, verses 24 to 26, he's describing a day from the, the book of Hosea when in other nations will be called the people of God meaning that the gospel is going to be taken to the Gentiles. And so this is what Paul writes in Romans 9, 24 to 26. He says, Even us whom he's called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, Those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Isn't that neat to see that, the, that, that theology, that thinking, even back then, was looking forward to a day when God's going to do a complete work all right, through a Messiah to come. So chapter 3 then, still in this, this marriage metaphor that we're looking at, Hosea is told to go and buy back his unfaithful wife, to buy her back. She's loved by another man. And this represents the, the covenant faithfulness of God. He frequently restored Israel many times after they had betrayed him. So Hosea bought her back, but required her to remain for a while without conjugal privilege. And so we see, um, like in Ezekiel, he had to do all these visual things before the people. So he not only wrote and preached, but he did some things that were to represent what God was telling him. So Hosea is told to go and buy her back and bring her into your home but you'll have no relationship with her. And this is looking forward then to a time, um, it says, Israel will dwell for many days without king or prince and without sacrifices. But, again, verses 4 and 5, there's language here that speaks of one who will come, a Messiah to come. Chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Chapter 3 is very short. Verse 4 says, The children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. David's been gone for 250 years, so he's talking about the one who would come in the line of David, speaking of the Messiah. So that's what we see then in chapter 3, 4, and 5 with that marriage metaphor then. The second major theme then would be the egregious sin of Israel. He capitalizes a lot on their sin. We talked about that in chapter 4. Uh, they're in clear violation as at least seven of the Ten Commandments. It names them there. Seven then being um, God's complete number. 
It's, it's like it's complete. It's, their pervasiveness of sin is throughout everything. And among the most serious offenses was they had mingled the worship of the one true God with the fertility God, with the fertility rites they were partaking. Um, pagan worship had become established in the land. And the only thing that's going to save them is a complete and total repentance. And that's going to be tough to come by. Uh, chapter 6, 1 to 3. The prophet's crying out to them. He says, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. And on the third day he will raise us up that we may live before him. Interesting language there, right? On the third day he'll raise us up. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. And look down at verse 6. The prophet says this, and this is quoted often in the New Testament we'll look at shortly. It says, For I desire steadfast love, which the Hebrew word has said, steadfast love or mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So what's being said here is the altars meant to be the place of forgiveness have become the place of their most terrible sin. It was supposed to be the place of atonement, but it had become a heinous crime against God. And so they're told in 9 verse 3 that they can no longer live in Yahweh's land. You're out of here. You're coming. You're, you're going to be going somewhere else. You're going to Egypt or to Assyria or somewhere. And that's basically what he was telling them. The language here in chapters 9 through 12 is... How the Lord always remained faithful despite their sin, despite their long history of turning against him. And the recurrent threat was either being sent back to Egypt or being sent into exile somewhere. And we know that's the Assyrians coming, uh, 722 B.C. It's eye-opening then to realize that God's judgment on Israel would affect the very things they hoped to be getting from their worship of Baal. They were looking to, give, to get stuff from this false god. Things like uh, agriculture prosperity, sexual vitality and fertility, altars and idols and military excellence. And God then in his judgment, he would deprive Israel of those very things. They were depending on Baal to give him. Interesting how that works. So that's about the sin of the people of Israel. And then the third and final major theme I mentioned earlier really covered ex extremely well in chapter 14, is the repentance and covenant renewal. Repentance and renewal of the covenant. They broke it. It needs to be renewed. God didn't break it. The people did. And so, Hosea's final message is for them to repent, turn to the Lord. And God, once again, is the one who initiates it. His love and patience are the result of His covenant promises. Be they didn't deserve it, and they didn't earn it. It's called grace. And we don't deserve it, and we didn't earn it. It's called grace. So the same thing going on then. They understand the covenant. Uh, if we go back to the books of Exodus, where it talked about the covenant at Sinai and then repeated again in Deuteronomy. That was the covenant renewal. And so from that background, we go to chapter 14. The mercy and grace of God are revealed in stark contrast to the people's sin. So I'm going to read here chapter 14. It's not very long. Just listen to the words that the prophet is using here. He says in verse 1 of chapter 14, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you've stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, Take away all iniquity except what is good, and we will pay with bulls and vows with our, of our lips. Assyria shall not save us, they had, they had turned to Assyria as one of their uh, hopes in the army of Assyria. We will not ride on horses, and we will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. In you, the orphan finds mercy. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. See the language here of, of God has turned. The anger has turned away, and there's coming a time when they'll be renewed. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall not take root like the trees of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive, his fragrance like Lebanon. They shall return and dwell beneath my shadow. They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. 
Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answered and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Wonderful picture of what God's going to do for his people. Amongst all that talk of their sin and unfaithfulness, God is still going to save them. So finally then, in the New Testament, Hosea is remembered as the, the prophet of Hesed, the prophet of, of covenant renewal, the, the, the prophet of mercy, the, the prophet of steadfast love and loyalty to the Lord. And looking at that concept then, Jesus quotes Hosea 6.6 6, twice in Matthew's Gospel, where he says, speaking of the Lord, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So Jesus quotes him too. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. He's teaching that the true worshipers of God have a heart for him rather than going through the motions of religion. Right? I think we can understand that. We can see that from the picture. Um, it was a lack of love for God that led them slowly into their apostasy. And the same thing can happen here in the 21st century. We can become comfortable. Uh, we think about the low country. We think about Mount Pleasant, the prosperity. And people trust in their bank accounts and their retirement accounts and their property and all that. And they say, what do I need the Lord for? I've got everything I need right here. Without realizing that they are terrible sinners, as each and every one of us, the man included, need a, re a redeemer. We need a savior. And so he's teaching that uh, this is what is essential for God's people. So Hosea then, in chapter 4, verse 6, quoted the Lord, where he says this. He says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And truly, we can see in the 8th century B.C., there was a lack of knowledge of God. And in our culture today, in our society we live in, there's a total lack of knowledge of God. We don't know God's Word. And so people stumble and fall, and a lot of people go through the motions, what I call the motions of religion. And... Nevertheless, despite our sin and our indifference to the things of God, Christ prevails as the true Son of Israel. We've seen Him not mentioned by name, but we certainly see the picture of the one who would come in the line of David and restore all things. So, what did He do? He obeyed the law perfectly. He's paid the penalty in full for our spiritual whoredom that Hosea talks about. He paid for it with His blood on the cross. And as a result, he's our only hope of justification before a holy God. There's no other way to be put right with God except through what Christ did and the faith in his blood. So as our Messiah, then Christ will bring about the final restoration and redemption of his people. Hosea mentioned it here using that marriage covenant that we had broken and that God will come and restore and make all things new through Christ. And that's, what, that's what Hosea is about. Hopefully now, um, when you think about Hosea, you'll, you'll see that, yeah, it was, a, it was a troubling time. People were trusting in things that, um, that they could hold in their hands instead of things that were eternal, and that's never a good thing. So, Anybody have any questions or comments about Hosea?